Suzanne DePass is an extremely successful music and film producer who was the vice president of Motown Records. Her illustrious career led her to discovering famous artists such as Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5, as well as Lionel Richie. She's produced several films, television shows, and miniseries. Her career has been a tremendous contribution to the entertainment industry. Did I get it right? No. Oh. I'm mostly that? right. Oh, good. Okay, yeah, mostly, mostly right. right. <laughs> All right. So you're obviously a very hard worker. Let's start with the present, then we'll go in the past. What are you working on now? Um, a lot of exciting things. You know, I want to just clarify that I was president of Motown Productions. Ooh. I exceeded vice president very soon after uh, I got there. So Even cooler. Very cool. But so, I started as Barry Gordy's creative assistant and sort of worked my way up. So you started r literally just like in the mailroom. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yet working for the guy that founded Motown wasn't exactly the mailroom, but it, the idea of being right. an assistant and they put creative in front of it because I couldn't type. So I was forced to think. <laughs> <laughs> and so all of the uh, creative matters that came to his office came to me. And I was uh, just turning 20. I like it. Okay, what are your projects you're working on now? Okay, so probably one of the most exciting projects that I really can't talk about a lot is a movie based on the life of Marvin Gaye. Oh. And uh, we're very excited about that. It's in early stages of development. We have a first draft of the script. And right. Some very exciting people are producing it, which I can't talk about. But Television or, or picture? No, or motion movie. picture. Okay. Motion picture. And um, that, I think, I, I've tried to get a Marvin Gaye project done forever. And the estate and never wanted to? It wasn't about the estate. It was about family. It was about rights. It was about a lot of things. And then we now partnered with a group that was able to plow through all that stuff and, and get it going. And... When we can talk about it, I'll come back. Okay, fine. Okay. I'm happy to have and, you back. And um, several television series. You know, we are a small company, but our taste is very eclectic. So if it appeals to us, we try to do it. And there's some projects I've been working on for 30 years, and there's right. some projects that are brand new. But um, we're doing a remake as a series of a movie that came out some time ago called Mahogany. Okay. Starring Diana Ross and Billy Dee Williams. And uh, we're doing that as a series. And, uh, you know, there are probably maybe 50 projects that we're, we're doing various stages of development. Some are unscripted, mostly scripted. Some are motion pictures. And, you know, it's, for me, as long as it continues to be fun and engaging, because I think at heart I'm a storyteller. And I love that part of it. The uh, Diana Ross, I think I saw a great photo of you with her in the back of a Rolls in the yes. 70s, in <laughs> yes. the 60s. 70s, probably. That was a great photo. Who took that? I have no idea. No like the chauffeur clue. or something? Yeah, right. I don't know. <laughs> you know, it was... Were you in New York you know, at I, the time? I, where was it? No, I, I don't even remember where it was. I used to travel with her a lot. And, um, you know, we started off on a kind of a rocky thing because I was working for... Um, her then boyfriend, Mr. Gordy, oh, and uh, ended up that she named her first child Rhonda Suzanne. So we we definitely had a rapprochement after during... you, mm -hmm. Suzanne. Really? Yeah, no other Suzanne in the in the. Of course mix. not. <laughs> does she still live at the Sherry in New York? Where no, does she live? I think uh, she sold that. I think she. Well, I know she has her home. She her lives main on, home. Yeah, in... Saint Ives, where my parents on. On uh, off Doheny. Off Doheny. I'm not sure she still has that house, uh, but she definitely has a beautiful home in Greenwich, Connecticut. Really? Mm -hmm. Does she still? Is she out of the business now, or is she? Not still... at all. I don't know. I didn't no. know. What is she doing yeah, these she, days? She she's very active. I think she's most recently uh, did a residency in Las Vegas, and uh, does I think a number of corporate dates that um, she. And she tours. She she did a tour last summer. Who's she married to? Or is she not? She's not at the moment. She's not at the moment. Right. Speaking of marriage, have you ever been married? Yes, I have. How many times? Once. How was it? It was enough. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was enough. enough. It was um, 16 years I was married. Um, I was married to uh, probably one of the nicest men and worst husband material 
not because of philandering or any of the things that usually, uh, but too artistic. He was an actor, uh -huh. or is an actor, and um, you know it was it was difficult because, um, as in many marriages back then, um, the woman is kind of the artist, and the man is kind of the business. And we had the exact reverse. Exactly. Yeah. So we would that go That was to, bad for his ego? No, not at all. I mean, the thing that was, it's hard to explain, but his um, approach to life was pretty selfless and pretty um, sort of, he was wrapped up in the art, not the commerce of being an actor. Hmm. He was never pushing me out of the way to look in the mirror. He was, you know, it was was a very um, kind of, we we should have gone to marriage counseling before we got married, I think, because you wouldn't have our value, married. well, I don't know, we would have made compromises in front, not Your values be forced were different? To, yeah. Our values became different because when we got married in 1978, um, and that wedding, I have to tell you, was quite something. Where was it? It was at the, uh, well, it was at, um, St. Albans Chapel on Hillguard, uh -huh. and the uh, reception was at your stopping grounds, the Remember Crystal Room. Hotel? Yeah. Oh, that's where I got married. Yeah, really? At the Crystal Ballroom. Right, and in the old Crystal. Same location, but Same yes. location, same exact location. Oh, that's fabulous. And um, it was very funny because uh, Paul, my ex-husband, is white, and uh, obviously I am not. And you're so, half white and half black, or you're all fully black? Fully, well, you know, I did the... Um, the gene thingy? Yeah, I did the whatever that thing is. Somebody gave me a kit and right. did the thing and got it back. And it said uh, some, something that I thought was kind of surprising. Jewish? 50, <laughs> no, 54% European okay. and 40 something percent, you know, African. Um, but my parents were not uh, considered anything but, you know, black. Where were they from? Jamaica. Oh. Well, my father was from. From Jamaica, and my mother's parents were from Jamaica. But you're very fair skinned. Were they also? Yeah, pretty That's much. Really, yeah. You know, my mother used to refer to us as Caribbean cocktails, you know, that, <laughs> because, you know, the French, the Scots, the yeah. English, all of that Caribbean um, trade. And there's so many uh, Asian Jamaicans also because of the way that the whole culture evolved. And so, um, it just is what it is. But I've been accused of being Egyptian. I thought you were Italian. You, Josh. I thought you were Italian. <laughs> yeah, well, anyway. <laughs> Very cute. Um, I think for us, that wedding was really, uh, because Paul had uh, starred in one of George Lucas's early films called American Graffiti. And so we had everybody from Barry Diller to uh, Rick James, to uh, Barry Gordy, to George Lucas, to you know, it was just this. Who was the was Paul's pot. last name? Lamat. And he was the star of American Greedy. American Greedy. American, American, American Greedy. Graffiti. American he Graffiti. American he started. He American was one of them. You know, it was an ensemble, but he, his character was really kind of the most popular because uh, he played the character of John Milner, who got stuck in the Yellow Deuce Coop with um, Mackenzie Phillips. Mm hmm. And you know who was a kid, and I think it was it was very interesting. And he he and George, um, you know, became good friends as a result. Okay, so you're were you born in Jamaica? No, I was born in New York City. Ooh, in the city. Mm -hmm. At like what part of town? I was born on 124th Street at Sydenham Hospital. Is that Harlem? Yeah. 124th, and where did you grow up? Same I grew, location? I, no, I grew up um, in Harlem, went to private school, summered in Martha's Vineyard, and basically had what I consider to be, went to private school. So your parents were very successful? Middle class. Middle you know. class. Well, private and, school, Martha's Vineyard. Yeah, and um, my mother's father, my maternal grandfather, was a physician, and he bought our home in Martha's Vineyard in 1944. So, and it's still in the family. Really? Mm -hmm. Do you have siblings? Nope. So it's yours? No, because I have, uh, he, my mother had two sisters. Ah. 
And so, so you and the cousin split it or whatever? Yeah. I mean, my main cousin, who is the widow of uh, Tom Clancy, the oh, author. Of course. Um, she really handles all of that stuff. Yeah, that's funny. Wait, didn't he have uh, the Jasper Johns American flag paintings? Yes, I think so. Yeah. I, first, I think the daughter, I think I knew his daughter. Do you have a daughter? He did. Okay. He did. Um, okay, let's talk about Michael Jackson. Okay. How'd you discover him? Um, I had just gone to work at Motown. Then, at the time, Motown would put the out-of-towners who were coming to work at the company in a, uh, most of us, in a building, a high-rise in East Detroit called, it was 1300 East Lafayette. And Diana Ross had the penthouse. And they put me in the building, and there were executives and artists in the building. And one of the artists in the building was a man named Bobby Taylor. And he was part of a group called uh, Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's, of which um, Tommy Chong was a member of Cheech and Chong. Yeah. So it was like I know all this kind of mixed up people who went on to do other things. Let's call it that way. And he called me one day, and he said... Um, Listen, I want you to come down to my apartment. There's something I think you need to see. <laughs> and I went, Bobby Taylor, I am not coming to your apartment, period. He said, no, no, it's nothing like that. So I went down to, um, I think I was on the 22nd floor, and he was like on the 10th floor or something. And when I got, got to his apartment, there were these kids strewn across his living room. And he kind of clapped his hands, and he said, okay, you guys, this is Suzanne DePass, and she works for Mr. Gordy, and... She can get us the audition with Motown because right. I was I was mobbed up. Right, and so they got up and they sang I think three or four songs a cappella, and it was unbelievable. It was really <laughs> magical, and I was like, wow. And of course, this is all in the primitive times before cell phones and texting. But you were and you were his assistant. I was his creative assistant. Creative he had assistant. three other assistants. You know, I was the one. If a record came in that he needed to hear, I listened to it and gave him a report. If there was an act that needed to be auditioned, I blah blah. You know, um, who, you know who was performing. So I would how, go. By to the way, the club. how did you get that gig? I mean, that's pretty... that's a whole long story. You know, <laughs> I mean, we'll that's go there. A whole Don't other worry. Thing. Okay. Time. <laughs> So anyway, um, I went back upstairs to my place and um, called his office, called Barry Gordy's office. And I don't think I reached him till the next day. And I said, oh, Mr. Gordy, I just saw the, the most incredible act. And he said, great. And I said, wait until you see these kids. And he said, kids? Kids? <laughs> kids? I don't want any kid acts. Are you crazy? Do you know how much trouble Stevie Wonder is? Yeah. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And so my big claim to fame is that I was relentless in terms of, and remember now, when I went to work at Motown, Barry Gordy was already vastly successful. Right. And Motown had superstars from the Four Tops to Smokey Robinson to the Temptations to Diana Ross and the Supreme. You know, it wasn't like some startup. No, I understand. So for me to overcome the intimidation of being the new girl in this very entrenched uh, culture, it, it took, I think now I look back on it, I, I was pretty courageous. I'm probably more courageous then than I would be now. Um, you know, to sort of beat somebody up, you have to see them, you have yeah. to see them, you have to see them. And when he did, of course, the rest is history. So how did you, where, do you remember, where, where did he see them audition? Did they, they came to his office? Like what? I went to, to um, the office building downtown. Because by that time we had, you know, Motown started in these little houses on West Grand Boulevard in Detroit. And by that time, um, soon after I got to the company, they moved downtown to what was called the Donovan Building. And that's where they auditioned. Interesting. So does he plots on the floor in like amazement when he hears no, it? No, no, he, he. he I got mad props for um, bringing them to the company. And in fact, the next group that I wanted to bring, they didn't even have to see them. He just said, sign them. Ah, 
Was it a good girl? The next one? Yeah, the Commodores with Lionel Richie. So wait, hold on. So now <laughs> you've discovered Lionel Richie also. Yes. Okay. That's a small one. <laughs> right. Wow. Okay. So now tell so wait. Let's finish with Michael. Okay. Fine. Okay. Let's finish with Michael. Okay. So now mm -hmm. Michael's a kid, Jackson five. Then are you close with him this whole time? Yeah. I mean, what happened was as a result of uh, Motown right. signing them. Right. I was assigned along with my cousin who had come to visit, and that was like 50 years ago. He's never left. <laughs> so um, we were assigned to do everything for the Jackson 5 except the recordings. So okay. we did the choreography. We did the clothes. We did the lineup of the show. When you say you did, did the choreography. You found the choreographers? No, no, no. You see, you're coming at it from a contemporary model of how people put things together today. Right. Back in those days, there was no such thing. We had no laminated passes. There, were, you know, there was no choreographers. We did it in my living room. So you invented the the dance moves with them, yeah. But were you? Did you have a background in dance? Like, how does that well, work? Well, I, I had a background in disco. <laughs> <laughs> so. No, but I mean, don't people have like, like you? Okay, okay, maybe it's different. I mean, don't you? If you're making moves and whatever with a, don't you want to know? Like, don't you, I don't know what I'm asking. Yeah, right. I, know, I think I know what you're asking, which is, who told you you could choreograph? I guess, yeah. So, yeah. Like, how did you know to be a choreographer? But because I think in those days, it was more like, um, whatever job needs to be done, you figure it out. But with And the... there was no such thing as the, I mean, Motown had a choreographer whose name was Charlie Atkins. But by the time we were working on I Want You Back choreography, the company, well, Barry Gordy and his staff and a lot of us had moved to Los Angeles. Right. So the guys were kind of not famous yet. You know, I right. what I'm excited about in terms of legacy is I got to take the ride with them from complete anonymity to superstardom. And many, many people who lay claim to a Michael Jackson relationship or something, he was already Michael Jackson, but I saw the the, um, the evolution and took that journey. Do you have great photos of the two of you? I have some substantial ones, yeah. You know, I don't have a lot because in those days there was no such thing as a selfie. You right. didn't have a personal photographer following you around. So, uh, but I have a few that are really special. So you started uh, with him in Detroit. Uh -huh. And came out to Los Angeles with him, or no, no, no. Um, what happened was they went back to Gary, Indiana, where they're from, right, and waited to be called to record. And those early days were, um, you know, sort of hit and miss in terms of a schedule. It wasn't like until Barry Gordy got involved in creating their music, there was really nothing much happening. Have you ever been nominated for an Academy Award? Yes. For which film? Lady Sings the Blues. I was co-writer of the wow. script. And the other Emmy that you won was for? Motown Returns to the Apollo in 1985. So in 83 we won, and then in 85 we won again. So you would produce it. What would Barry Gordy have to do with it? He would come and kibitz, <laughs> you know. But um, what I think... The way I would describe it is that um, I was the one to implement, and then he would come along and supplement. You know, he would see something or make a suggestion. Always, you know, very welcome. And so that that whole uh, dynamic was um, exciting. So Lionel Richie, tell me, where did you just? Oh, a little bit. Hold on. Let's go back to my chance for a second. What was your relationship like with his father? Horrid. I get, that's why I'm asking. I can only imagine. Yeah. Describe the man he was back then and the man he became. Um, you know, I hate to speak ill of people who aren't here anymore. And but Joseph has, you know, passed away. And I respect, here's what I, I feel about Joseph. I respect what he had put into his family to create the Jackson Five 
and take them to a certain level. And I think what happened is that when Motown came in, he kind of, it was like a love-hate situation. Right, he needed them, but he hated, he was despised you know, the other fact way, that it wasn't that, his Because he anymore. wasn't in charge anymore. And so, because I was responsible for all these other aspects, finding them a house, putting them in school, getting doctor's appointments, you know, in addition to... to choreographing? And choreographing <laughs> and, and costuming. This shit would never happen today. I know, I know, it's gosh. Insane. I would never do it again today. So, um, So he was very disgruntled all the time. And any time that he could um, exert his, his parental birth, authority, yeah. he would do it. And it just made... Everything my more job more complex complicated. We were doing, we we did a ABC an ABC special with them called Going Back to Indiana, which is of course where they're from. Yeah, Gary. And so we're filming in Gary, Indiana, the ABC special, the concert portion of the show. And the kid, you know, in those days there weren't the kind of barricades at stages, you know, that we have today. So there were some like wooden horses in front of the stage. Right. We were in this, you know, arena that had been sold out. And the kids came on and they started to sing and the kids in the audience went berserk. They rushed the stage and Joseph got the boys into a limo and took them back to the hotel. Oh, that's normal. Right. And I had... An empty stage. I had an empty stage and 12 and, cameras. And minutes to fill. Wait, was this live? It's, no, it wasn't live. Oh, no, God, no. Can you imagine? No. So <laughs> I had to go to the hotel and get them to come back and redo the concert. Wait, wait why would they have to... Wait, oh, it must have happened right in the beginning of the concert? It had, it had, we didn't have enough in the can for what we had planned. Did all the people in the audience just sit there and wait for him to come back? How did they know he would be coming back? They didn't. So they just sat there and assumed, oh, let's well, see no, what happens no. I here. mean, there was a voiceover announcement, but I didn't know. What was going to happen. Right. I mean, I had to. I had to. Um... So you go back, and I'm sure you're screaming at. at what's, well, at... you know, I had to be very po political. I said, Joseph. <laughs> Joseph? Yeah. Not Joe? No, God, no. Um, <laughs> Why, isn't that what everyone knows him as, Joe Jackson? All the kids called him Joseph, and all of us called him Joseph. Not dad? Never called him dad. Really? Mm-hmm. Is, did you find that weird at the time too? I, I didn't have time to to think about these things. Yeah, right. We're just what trying to get weird. these people. In to... hindsight, yes, but not not at the at the time. But um, you know, it was like talking to a mental patient because <laughs> it was. Now you know we're doing this show, and this special means everything to the kids, and we, we need have you to, to go back, back the fuck off. No, I, we have to go back. Blah blah blah. You know, it was like I felt like I had. A, stethos a stethoscope around my neck and a white coat trying to, you know, ease him back into the limo to go. And and we finally did. And we got the stuff in the can and like that. But I'm just saying that he could have prevented that of course. from happening because he is the legal was guardian. Was he just trying to exert his power or was he scared for the boys when he that happened? He was scared for the boys. But then... Because I had to come and grovel, it it transformed into make me, you know, that kind of thing. Did you ever get into real screaming matches with him? Mm -mm. Really? No, no, because again, I'm a kid myself, basically, and he's the boy's father. No, there was one time where I did go off. We were in New York at the Americana, what was then the Americana Hotel, and there was something that we had to do, and he had taken them out of the hotel, down Broadway, to do whatever. And Go sightseeing? <laughs> go get a burger. I don't know. Right? But but they were famous enough then. That people would mob them. Right, but that he had no business doing that and not telling me and not right. letting me make sure that at least one security person was with them. And that's the one time I can recall going off. Is my growling stomach coming through? Okay, good. In any event, that is uh, okay. So Joe Jackson, and what about the kids? Which were besides Michael? Which one were you closest with, or was it Michael you were closest with? Well, Michael, yeah, for sure. Um, I love Latoya. 
Yeah, well, I, I see her at the market I have, sometimes. I have actual um, footage of a rehearsal that we were doing. Barry Gordy always provided for documentation of many, many things. And we would audio tape a lot of the meetings. For what? Uh, posterity. You know, or also to say, you know, somebody who tried to say, I didn't say that. And he'd been, run the tape back. Um, well, kind of clever. Not yeah. secretly, just no, on no, the table. and with permission from everybody. Kind of clever. But it also, it was a good way to preserve. The, you know how sometimes people have a great idea, and then you say, "Well, tell me that again," and they never also, do it the same way. But also, did they ever do a documentary on the audio tapes of all these years? Yeah, it's there's a current documentary on Showtime um, that basically part of the documentary shows a transcript of you hear the tape and you can read the words. And it's about putting out the song My Girl. Yeah. Because we used to have a creative meeting every week, and they'd bring the records to uh, the meeting. You were there for how long? I started in 1968, and um, I was there even after he sold the company in 1988. And then I started my company in 1992. Who did he sell the company to? Um, he sold the company to... Uh, Polygram. Who still owns it? No, Polygram. No, and no then Polygram around. sold to Universal. Right. So Universal owns the, the library. They own the library and they own the mark, the Motown mark, and the contract. Do you think Barry Gordy is happy he sold it or not? Yes. Really? Mm -hmm. Definitely. It, isn't it just gen a cash cow? No. You know, the word overhead comes to mind. And the... Uh, the business had changed from independent distributors to sort of these corporate, you know, to, to dis distribute records. You do know what a record is, right? Yes, dear, I do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I even so know what an 8-track is. Are, there, are, <laughs> there are people who consume music today that don't even understand the concept of paying for it. But back in those days, People actually went to the store and bought a record. Of course. And the way that they could go to the store and buy a record was through a form of distribution. And when the independents, which had been the the uh, category that Motown reached the stores, the records from Motown reached stores through independent distributors, when that became more corporate, you know, the big guys, Warner Brothers, WEA, you know, Warner Electra yeah. Atlantic and Universal and um, RCA and those companies, the deals that one could make for distribution became less and less independent and more and more corporate. And so because the business had changed that much, it was a culture shock basically to the way Motown operated. And it wasn't nearly as independent or lucrative and you know we were we were a small but extremely successful company privately held what most people don't understand is if uh, if a dollar wasn't spent it belonged to Barry basically and um, Clive Davis as an example whom I have mad respect for and love and that's where we met Clive and that's Davis's where we met party. exactly which was, by the way, a very funny meeting. We'll go over <laughs> that. Yeah. That was. That we, was. <laughs> we're supposed to end up. With, we, somehow I end up in her car with her. By the way, she's got the greatest car ever. She has a black BMW 7 Series with red leather interior and a driver who's fabulous. Has been with her for 100 years. Right. And we're driving the van. We end up at Diddy's house. Right, well, outside on the street. Oh, yeah, we that's true. We ended in. up on the street with. We were, I mean, I don't even know. We were, oh, we were stuck on the street for right. And by the time we, you had to go in the back and raid two glasses of red wine, exactly at, at the polo lounge. Uh, well, hello, <laughs> right? Because that seems like a surprise. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so that whole thing, really, um, apart from the fact that the business was changing in terms of how people consumed music, the overhead to service. All of the acts, the studio, the employees, all that kind of stuff was a burden because it, during that change, there was a decided dip in revenue. 
Mm -hmm. So if you're losing money and you're having to spend more money, make up the difference from your pocket, if somebody wants to come along and pay you $60 million to take it off your hands, you do it. How much was it? 60. And that was in 1988. Um, but a couple years later, it sold for 300. To? Universal. Right. But, you know, if you're a smart businessman, I'm just assuming Barry Gordy is, I'm sure that he took that 60 and made it, you know, a lot more. We're not going to take up a collection for Barry Gordy. No, I mean, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. I feel so sorry. Right. What, no, is he, he, does he, what does he do today? You know, he, he claims to be retired, and yet he he's very active in, in um, his estate and... I can't tell you because he can't tell me. I talk to him all the time, but... You just call him up? No, he calls me up. <laughs> <laughs> just to shoot the shit? Well, you know, I don't want to break it to him, but I don't work for him anymore, but he doesn't know it. <laughs> so he calls you and says, hey, I need you to do this or that? He's, you know, I have to do a speech. Um, can you give me some ideas? Oh, that's uh, cute. That's just Yeah, like... no, I mean, listen, he will call me and I'll be in our conference room with five people trying to close a deal and uh your secretary will, will come, come in and say, say we have mr gordy right, on the phone right. <laughs> which so by I, the way is the best way to close the deal right exactly you should actually time it every time right. you're trying to close the deal <laughs> right. right when the banker's about to right. sign the paper <laughs> oh mr gordy's on the phone right. yeah it's a good ploy but right? in this case it's it was true. real so um i'll go to my office and um He'll say, uh, so what's up? I'm going, hey, boss, blah, blah, blah. Boss? Uh, mm -hmm. You still call him boss? Sometimes. Or chair. Or chairman. You have an Emmy. You have two Emmys. You're calling him <laughs> boss? Okay, oh, go yeah, on. But, you know, it makes him feel good. Okay. And um, so what's going on? I said, well, I've got this deal. We're about to close. i got five people in the conference room and blah, 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 blah. And he says, oh, that's great. Now listen. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, but... What I what I will say is that um, over the course of time, I have referred to him as my mentor and my tormentor. Aww. Because working for him was difficult. Do you guys ever go out to dinner? Oh, yeah. Where do yeah. you guys like to go? Um, he likes to stay home because he's a vegan. And um, when we go, we maybe go to Soho or... Um, Spago. Um, I love that house. I've never seen the inside, but I'm sure mm -hmm. it's fabulous. Well, you know, it's, it's an English tutor, it, isn't it? It's it's a Paul. Um, it's a Paul Williams. Paul Williams house. Oh, yeah. really? Uh huh. Yeah. You know, the interesting thing about Paul Williams. Um, I don't know if you know the history of this, but well, I'll tell the viewers. Paul Williams was a black architect in the 19 started in the 1920s. My grandfather had his house built by Paul Williams, and Paul Williams was trained to sketch upside I down. Guess. And keep his hands behind his back. Well, how do you do that if you're sketching? No, no, no. I'm saying that <laughs> when when he sketched upside down, when he was done, right. he oh, put yeah. his hands behind so his back. So he'd sketch upside down because he wasn't allowed to sit on the same side of the table as his, you know, as his clients, clients, you know, trying to show them what to do. So he'd have to learn to do it upside down. My great grandfather was one of his first clients and he did not make him sit on the mm -hmm. other side of the table. In fact, he said, come over here and sit right next to me. Yeah. True that's story. That's great. Didn't he do the polo lounge? He did the, yes, he did the renovation of the, he did the Crescent Wing and the Pole Lounge, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh, exactly. Yeah. So the house, um, I think Barry's added on to it. I think he bought the properties on the sides, all up on, even on Cecina, too, up yeah, or whatever. he brought the, the two on top because he didn't want people looking down on me. Are those houses just empty? <laughs> no, one is an office. Oh. And the other is partially an office and a residence for staff. It's a big compound. Mm-hmm. What style? Uh, Just very traditional. <laughs> Is Anga <-pashed? laughs> So, like Michael Jackson Anga <laughs> Oh God. Well, the the um, one of the houses is kind of what I would call that fifties ranch. Right. And the other one I couldn't describe in a million years. Oh, I God. mean, you would have to tell me because Neverland. I don't know. No, no, God, no, no, not at all. But um, anyhow, the the uh, the Motown years were incredible. I feel so fortunate that. I was able to, at a very uh, early stage of my trajectory in, in the business, sit in on 
all kinds of meetings that I never would have been able to just coming into some random corporation. What's your relationship with Lionel Richie? It's good. I mean, good. do you ever hang? Do you guys well, talk on the phone ever? Um, I'm trying to think the last time. Probably about a year ago, I went to dinner at his house. You know? Oh, yeah? That's yeah. a fabulous house. It's a great house. It's a great house. And um, he has a wonderful uh, woman in his life now, Lisa, although his first wife, Brenda, is a friend also. You know, and it's all very happy and right. congenial and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, we're all busy, you know? Yeah. And it's it's just like with Smokey or You're Diana Smokey? or... Huh? Yeah. You're friendly with Smokey and yeah. Quincy Jones? And Quincy, I love Quincy. Um, you know, Quincy, Clarence Avant, and Barry are kind of all contemporaries. And um, they're all, all three of them are just great. But, of course, Barry's my favorite. That's cute. Yeah. Houses, where do you live? Tell me about where you live. I live on Oak Pass Road, and I've been there for over 30 years. I know this. I'm just asking for the oh, audience. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and um, I love that street. It's um, it's like I, I say, say. I tell people. I said, look, we have owls and coyotes and sometimes deer. I've even seen a mountain lion, but or large cat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I'm only 12 minutes from Neiman Marcus. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. So. And I hope Neiman Marcus stays. You never know. I know. I mean, rest in peace, Barney's. Absolutely. So sad. What's the best house you've ever been to in Los Angeles? Because I'm sure you've been to a lot of good houses. That's a good question, Josh. Let me think. Uh, the best house. Well, Lionel's is right up there. I think that's a great house. That's a damn good house. I'm... Yeah. Who is so? Oh, Nikki's very close with George Slaughter, isn't she? Carrie Brillstein's friends with them. I know yeah, that. Yeah. Yeah. I think Nikki's friends with, maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. George Slaughter. Laughing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's a really cool house. Who's your hero? Who's my hero? Uh, well, my shiro is my mother Babs. Your shiro? Yeah, who just passed away uh, in October. Was she living here in L.A.? She was living with me. Really? Yeah. Uh huh. And her caregivers. I mean, I had a whole thing going on. How old on was there. she? Ninety nine. Wow, she just died naturally, or yeah, you know, she got pneumonia, and, right, and stuff. But um, she really stuck by me through those years before you have credits and people recognize you for something, and you know, it's it's all a crapshoot. And um, I would have to say, without a doubt, she was really. The glue that held my ass in check. You know? What's your charity? Um, well, I love the Debbie Allen Dance Academy because I think what she's doing over there with young people who would otherwise maybe be tempted to um, do things that aren't necessarily productive, and through arts and through the arts and dance, uh, that's a big thing for me. And um, City of Hope. Really? Mm -hmm. My grandfather was on the board of City of Hope. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, um... Well, you have no kids. I have no so kids. So what's, what's going to be your charity one day? Um, you know, I'm still kicking the tires of, of stuff, but I, I think that, um, you know, I really, um, Think, I probably think I have more time left than I do in terms of making big decisions. <laughs> like I'm supposed to be writing my book. I'm supposed to be doing a documentary. I'm, you know, oh, there's a whole lot of stuff. Why aren't? Why don't you have a documentary? Well, I think I will in about a minute. Yeah. Come on, let's go. Okay. All right. What are you Josh? waiting for? <laughs> okay, Mr. Gordy Jr. Come on. <laughs> it's gonna be a good one. Yeah, it, it could be fun. Oh yeah. I think it could be fun uh, because I think. For me, the um, behind the scenes of things, I'm very interested in. You know, I, I like to look under the hood and see how things come together and the practices that kind of enable a certain amount of success. And 
You always yeah. have great jewelry every time I see you. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Last time you had a, a, a diamond, it wasn't a, even a diamond, it was a weapon. Right. It was a <laughs> piece of jewelry. It was like you could right. kill somebody with that well, thing. Well, like, like you said, I don't have kids. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Well, someone's got to get the diamond, though. Uh-huh. Ooh, yeah. wonder if someone's, people are going to be on your good side. Who was, did you have a jeweler? Where did you get that ring? It was fabulous. Um, it was, actually, it was a gift. That was a nice gift. Yep. That was a very nice. Was that? Would you say that was the best gift you ever got? I would say it was probably the most expensive gift I ever got. What was the best gift you ever got? A good report from my doctor. That's a cute one. Mm -hmm. That's a good. I like that. All right. On that note, we're having dinner tonight. Yes, we are, and we can talk more about the things that cannot be said. Oh yeah, <laughs> the, yeah, for sure. <laughs> And we're going to have, are we having red wine tonight? Are we having martinis? What no, are we I'm, having? I'm having vodka myself. Vodka martini. Vodka, vodka soda. I think the soda ruins it. You like that? I do. I like the little fizzy part. I like the fizzy part. And I don't want to drink straight. I, I don't like it. No, the, that tastes horrible. You know. I have a new one I love. It's actually it's delicious. It's grapefruit juice, which I'm not like a fan, but it's delicious. Vodka and a little bit of rum. Really? What's mm -hmm. that called? The Josh flag? No, it's actually, I can tell you after the interview, I can't say who taught it to me, but a okay. very famous old family here in Los Angeles. Oh, okay. It's called the Smiler because it makes smiler. you smile within five yeah. seconds. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah, that is a good one. I um, I kind of stick with vodka or maybe a tequila drink every now and then. I started a diet two days ago, and I think I, well, for dinner tonight, that's going to be a challenge because everything there is so fattening. And vegan is not particular. It's just, it's not healthy. It's just you're not eating meat. But yeah. So that's or how dairy, people think, oh, or... I'm going to eat vegan. It's going to lose weight. You're not lose weight no, eating what vegan. What kind of diet did you go on? The one that'll make me lose weight? I don't know. Just oh. not eating. I had rice cakes today. I had fish. At, actually, I had fish at Boa the other night. It was fabulous. Oh, Do you know Bruce Eskowitz? No. He's Lionel's manager. Uh-huh. Red Light. Okay. I just thought of it because I was at a party with him the other right. night. Um, so I guess tonight I'll have the salt and pepper and some fish and some oils. Sounds really exciting. Well, we'll talk about that because I don't think it's smart to... Um, Deprive yourself of oil. No, I'm saying there will be oil. Oh, there will be oil. Oh, I yeah. said no oil. Okay. No, I mean. Yeah. Well, you should try intermittent fasting. You know, it's funny. Bobby's done that. And I, have you done it? I'm doing it. That's why my stomach is growling. I haven't had lunch. I haven't had breakfast. It doesn't seem that hard because I don't eat. Literally, I don't think I will. I did have the rice cakes, but that's coincidental. I don't usually eat until dinner time. Really? Well. All the problem is I eat late. That's the problem. Yeah. Well. You don't want to go to sleep on it, but my eating window is from one to nine. Okay. And you usually go help. to bed by midnight. And so I don't eat again until one o'clock the next day. So it's 16 hours. That it's 16 make hours. Sense, that, then. Uh, one to nine. I don't eat between. No, no. I'm just saying that that's the window. I'm not necessarily eating during that. I mean, I, I will not eat before one in the afternoon. I don't ever crave to do that. Mm -hmm. So if I eat, why is it that I gain weight then? I eat dinner at seven and. Well, yeah. maybe you're not burning off what you're maybe eating. Maybe it's the wine. Oh, I forgot yeah. to mention I down a bottle of wine also. Right. Yeah, right. Well, I forgot to mention that one little detail. Yeah, right. Well, that will interfere. That with one little the, detail. Right. <laughs> with, uh, I mean, listen, I, I could easily drink a bottle of wine, but I don't want to drink wine because it's got so much sugar. Yeah. All right. Well. Any final notes? You know, I could talk to you all day long, basically, because what's more fun than talking about me? Exactly. And <laughs> I agree. I wonder if I could find that photo of you with Diana Ross and the rules. Like, I wonder who has the, like, is it Getty Images? I wonder who owns yeah. that photo. I, um, I've seen it recently. I saw it recently, too, somewhere. Yeah. That's what made me think about it. Yeah, exactly. But, um. Well, there you yeah. go. The Emmy-winning... Academy Award nominated. Don't forget the Golden Globe. Golden Globe winning. <laughs> Anything else? Well, there's a lot more, but you know, let's. Oh, and beautiful. Oh well, thank you, babe. <laughs> beautiful Suzanne to pass. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.